I'm Brian Mahar. Welcome to Scaling Green's Communicating Energy Lecture Series. It's an ongoing conversation about the intersection of energy, policy, and communications. I'm here today with Judith Schwartz, the founder of To The Point, where she educates and markets about some of the most innovative technologies out there. Judith's been involved in energy efficiency and smart grid for many years, and she's spoken at numerous conferences and webinars uh, trying to help educate and create awareness uh, for consumers and stakeholders. And she's here with us today to talk a little bit about the smart grid. Well, thank you for being with us here. I'm delighted to be here. It's always fun to talk about smart grid. Absolutely. And you know, we've gotten really excited about smart grid lately, but I don't think a lot of consumers really know about the smart grid. Yet, I think we find that when people know a little bit more about it, they really want it. Well, this is one of the ironies about it, is that when you talk about the benefits and you talk about why people would care about it, then they are very interested. And I think that, but most of the time, people don't give a lot of, spend a lot of time thinking about electricity in their house unless it's not there. So I was wondering maybe actually if you could talk a little bit more about sort of the value of the smart grid for consumers. You know, what are the things that they can really get out of it? You know, let's think about why people should care. What this technology enables is basically three different things. So the first point is it can be either information, incentives, and automation that will make it easy for people to reduce their energy use. It also allows you to integrate clean generation and transportation. So it will now become possible to have solar or wind at various scales to be able to, to use storage when it becomes economically viable and to be able to use EVs or trucks or electric transportation because it's now going to be something that you'll be able to do and manage effectively. And then it also allows you to reduce and pinpoint and restore outages more quickly. And so those three levels of capability are why someone is going to care about it. But the reasons why someone are is going to care is going to vary based on that. I think that what we have to look at energy literacy in the same way that we used to look at computer literacy. So when we were starting to introduce personal computers, no one knew why they wanted these things. Okay, and so we had to go out and make connections with people so they understood. And it needs to be a series of conversations. It's not a commercial. You can't make someone fluent in a new language with, with a TV commercial. And this was something that, that was learned by the PowerSense DC pilot. It's something that's come up. And so we've been doing a lot of work in this area. And um, when you give people multiple conversations to learn about energy from their perspective, they really get into it and they like it. And all of a sudden, it becomes something that they care about. But I think that this is the part about it that it's going to take time and until we get the policies aligned so that we have the price signals there to help and set, we're not going to get larger groups of people seeing why it's meaningful to them. You know, you're talking about energy literacy. Ron Rash, the president of the Solar Energy Industries Association, has a really great story. Obviously, he has solar panels on the roof of his home. And he got a great monitoring system, so he's very excited about it. So. You know, he went to look at night when all the kids were in bed, lights were out, to see how much energy his home was using. And he was just shocked by the amount of energy his home was using when, when everyone was asleep. So he went out and he unplugged everything he could, the cable box, the, the refrigerator, I think even, just to see how low he could get it. But I, I guess the lesson of that is you, you, we can really be much better energy consumers, much smarter energy consumers. I think a lot of people tend to equate smart grid with smart meters. Is, is there a danger in that? Yes, there is a definite danger in that because it's like saying the whole value of the internet is your router. <laughs> and all the meters are are the endpoint device, just like a router. You have a router in your house, and that's how you get internet service. Okay, so it's not the importance isn't the meter. The importance is the electricity that is coming through and the information that you can get from it. That's what makes it smart. And so I think that when people um, want to use the internet, 
they, they focus on the benefits of the internet. They don't focus on the router. It's just something you have. And I think that's where we have to get to in this discussion, is the benefits of smart grid are all the things that you could do as a result, and the benefits that we can get societal and personal. And the meter is just kind of the incidental device that it goes through. Speaking of other arguments against the smart grid, one of them is, well, you can install the smart meters you want, but most people are still going to have dumb appliances at home, so why are we even doing it? Just because somebody got a smart meter, they're not going to run out and replace their $3,000 refrigerator if the refrigerator isn't due to be replaced, mm -hmm. okay, to get some nice, okay. So the transition of the prices to devices idea, the trend, that's going to be 10 years, 15 years. It's not a short-term thing. So the appliance thing, it's going to have to become more ubiquitous before that. And there are going to have to be the price signals. And there are hardly any places where there are price signals. So there's no incentive for someone to go out and get the refrigerator to save money mm -hmm. if there's no signal that's going to do it. So it's a chicken and egg thing. You have to, you have, to have the prices in order to do it. And I think that... The appliances will be there in the future, but it's, it's not going to be the short-term thing. You have to see a benefit. You have to see some, the load has to shift in a meaningful way before all the, the appliances are going to be replaced. Yeah, I've started joking that it is easier to get consumers to change their behavior than it is to get utilities to change theirs. And I think part of the problem is that the way utilities are used to communicating is, you know, they have a monopoly with the customers. The customer, you know, really just has to take it. They don't have any choice. And now, if you want the customer to do something, well, you have to speak with them and have a two-way exchange so that you, as the person who's offering the service, is listening to your customer and understanding what they're going to care about. And it's not the same for every person. So should we really be marketing to a specific sector or subsector? So normally, when you're starting a new technology, you have the luxury of you don't have to talk to everybody. You right. can just pick those people. And the, and the hard part is, how do you find them? Right. Okay, that's the hard part. Here, every single person in the United States, pretty much, is a consumer. Mm -hmm. So everybody's there. The beauty of that is, you just have to talk to them. Now, if you start talking to people on a regular basis, you will see the patterns that line up with the market research. So when you look at segmentation, the segments that, that I like to talk about, those patterns show up again and again and again. Okay? They show up across the country. They show up across the world. The mix is different where you are. So if you're in the Bay Area of California, the mix is going to be really different than if you're in the hills of Kentucky. Right. Okay? And if you're in New England, okay, Vermont is going to be, and Massachusetts are going to be really different than New Hampshire. Okay? So there are these, it's not strictly regional, it, it sort of has to do, and it aligns actually political, you know, with some political patterns. Okay? And so this is one of the things that is really cool because you as marketers, people who are the marketing departments uh, at utilities um, can take the research and just go talk to people and then find out who in their area, what do they really care about. And so that is a wonderful luxury that we hardly ever get. You know, it's not usually this clean, but this thing just keeps showing up so consistently. I've just been astounded. You know, what, what do you think worked about that? And, how that, can that be deployed in other communities? So um, one of the things that's happening now, so the pilot was several years ago, and they had very good results. And what one of the things that came out of it was that um, they made a special point to recruit low-income customers. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was one of the design criteria that they did. because. Because that had been one of the issues that got raised is, is it just wealthy affluent people who are willing to do this? What about, what about people who are? And people loved it. I mean, this is one of the things that I don't understand 
why there isn't more support from the low income advocates, because it's really good. People like that this is something they control, and the 20 to $30 a month that they can save is meaningful to them. They can take their kids to the movies, or they can do something that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So Judith, that's something that can really improve the utility's bottom line. Yes, I think it can, because what it's going to allow the utility to do is to make better choices about where the generation is coming from, and then also how it gets used and where it gets used. So if you are a warehouse, okay, and, it and what you're storing is temperature insensitive, what do you care if the temperature goes up on a hot afternoon? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Okay, you can even send people home if, it, if, the, if the money's worth it, you know, it's mm -hmm. sort of, but if you're a movie theater mm -hmm. and you're the destination on a, on a hot day, well, then you care about keeping it cool. Now, you can also, as a movie theater, say, I'm going to put ice storage on the rooftop and I'm going to pre-cool the movie theater because not a lot of people come to the movies in the morning, so I can have it be really cold in there in the morning, and then by the time the afternoon comes and the early evening and people are coming to the movies, now it's leveled off to another temp a temperature that's reasonable. So when you're a destination spot for cool, you have to be a little more creative in how you might help flatten the load. I mean, that's beneficial as well because your electricity prices are going to be lower in the morning, at least for the, the grid operators. Uh, so to not be cranking up the AC in the middle of the afternoon right. when, when the prices are going to be the highest, that, that helps, I guess, with the general grid operation and, and costs. You know, one of the things, obviously, Green Tech Media uh, does a great job of, mm -hmm. of educating all of us about smart grid. And they had a, a recent article, Seven Tips to Help Consumers Love the Smart Grid. And one of those tips for engaging consumers is to anticipate and answer questions. So I guess my question is to you, what are some of the questions that you would anticipate? Well, I think that the one that, that I think is most important to anticipate for people is, is this going to change my life? Do I have to change how I live my life? And the response that I think you need to do as a, as a marketing person at a utility or whatever is to say, well, what's, Tell me about your life, okay? So that because depending on who the person is and what their issues are, your answer is going to be completely different. So a lot of times I'll be at a dinner party and I'll talk a little bit about what it is I do. And, pe and people are always interested. People are always engaged. And so I'll start to go down sort of some of the paths and I'll watch somebody's body language and I'll see if I kind of hit the wrong nerve, okay? And so then I back up and I started down a different path and then I'll find like what they care about. And if I can find out what they care about, okay, then I can say, well, here's how it helps you. And so I think that that's the most important way because you can know for sure that you cannot tell how someone is going to react by just what they look like or how old they are or where they live, it's completely independent of them. Well, Judith, thanks for your time. I think we're all a lot smarter on Smart Grid now after hearing you. So I guess I'd just like to finish up by asking, you know, what do you see as the future of Smart Grid? Where do you see it going? Here's what I hope will be the future of Smart Grid, that it will become an enabling tool to achieve what society realizes they have to do. So we need to tie sustainability to economic value and economic vitality. And by taking care of our planet and doing what's needed, then we'll all be better off on so many levels. And it's just the way to get, it's one way to get there.